So our next speaker is Pete Knoll. He has served as the executive director of Puente since 2009 in Oaxaca, Mexico, where he and his family um, currently live. The organization's mission is to contribute to food, food sovereignty and advance the health and well-being of rural communities in Mexico by promoting the cultivation, consumption, and commercialization of amaranth. Pete has also served two terms as president of the Amaranth Institute. And if you have not taken the opportunity to look at the Amaranth Institute's resources, I, I would highly encourage you to do that. They have a great listserv and a lot of great resources. Previously, Pete served two years as the deputy director for the Democracy Without Borders Foundation in Honduras and was a Peace Corps volunteer in Guatemala before that. Pete has a graduate degree from the School of Public Policy and Management at Carnegie Mellon University. Please join me in welcoming Pete. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity to share with you all. Um, it's a lot like my work except in the villages, no one sits in the front row, and I usually speak Spanish. But the title of my talk is Adoption of Amaranth in the Local Context of Oaxaca, Mexico. This is the clicker. Um, and I just wanted to share um, more than a rigorous set of findings or academic research process, my goal much like they've already commented, is to just share with you my personal experience at Puente. And hopefully this space with you um, will generate reflections and identify opportunities so that we can take collective and individual actions in our diverse areas of work. And just, I saw in the program, there's a number of people from Central America, but I just wanted to ask if, for a quick assessment, has anyone here been to Oaxaca, Mexico? There we go feel more comfortable already. And then the second question is how many are familiar with amaranth? Even better, there we go. And then finally, the concept of food sovereignty, or some concept of food sovereignty. Great. Well, if I do my job today, then we'll even have more headway towards understanding Puente's work over the past 10 years. The organization's 15 years old. I came on 10 years ago. So what are my qualifications and what are not? Um, if I go all the way back, I was raised in the family home with my father, an Episcopal priest. So you can say that at an early age, I had a lot of exposure to mission and service. In high school, I went to Cotin, Haiti with our local um, church group. But now fast forwarding the clock, <clears throat> after graduating from college, I moved out to Los Angeles to take a job at the Tax and Financial Group located in Newport um, Beach, which was quite a different experience. And I quickly came to realize that I was seeking something different. And I had the opportunity to apply for the Peace Corps. And those who have done Peace Corps know that it takes a number of months, up to a year, before you might actually get uh, assigned a country. And I was fortunate to go to Guatemala. And I served three and a half years um, actually in the non-agricultural related work, was teaching in schools, and um, just really found like my passion to use my skills was towards um, Latin America in particular. And although I had sh moved back to Santa Fe and was going to take a s service with the National Forest Service, there was an opportunity after two earthquakes that devastated El, El Salvador in 2001 to go back through Crisis Corps, which was at that time kind of a follow-up return Peace Corps volunteers, and work for six months in Usulután in El Salvador. After that, I, um, my sister had come down to Oaxaca. To, she's an ESL teacher to learn Spanish, as much of her students um, were Spanish speakers. And she invited me to Oaxaca to get to know it. It's a magical place for those who have been there before. And there I got a job at another nonprofit, which was in Puente, 
I met my wife, who's a local doctor in Oaxaca, and that was part of my first introduction to southern Mexico. After an incredible three years of experience on the ground, I decided I was ready to go back to graduate school, and Peace Corps has a number of fellowships, and I was able to go study my Master's of Science in Public Policy and Management at the Heinz School in Carnegie Mellon University near my hometown in Pittsburgh. I heard Beaver Falls from Dr. Martin. From graduate school, I got a job with the, at that time, well, the Democracy Without Borders Foundation and based out of Tegucigalpa, Honduras. Um, some of you who might be more familiar with Latin American politics, it was kind of a brainchild of Robert White, a former U.S. ambassador who was against uh, military invention in Central America during the Cold War. And we worked on human rights, transparency, and accountability environmental protections, among other issues. It was an incredible experience, but having my boss, my wife, from Oaxaca when this opportunity opened up here at Puente, um, we decided to return to Oaxaca. <clears throat> but apart from the formal qualifications, those who have worked in, in other um, experiences, I believe as much has been learned actually in action. Um, I believe my real education has been in the countless communities that we serve in Oaxaca. Two, while I visited hundreds of farms in my 10 years at Puente, I'm not a farmer and I'm not a peasant farmer either. I'm not a specialist in nutrition, agriculture, or entrepreneurship. What I will share is my experience um, and I also I have a sense that almost all the solutions that we come about probably already exist in some form. And I believe this distinction is important, and I've developed a deep admiration for the people who dedicate their lives to feed their families, to feed us, the non-farmers. Sometimes it's romanticized, but I do think when you really think about 7,000 years of agriculture, it's more how the system has devalued the work that goes into farming. I believe in Robert Chambers' approach to participatory processes for development, much derived from Paulo Freire, and I think we need to also unlearn a lot of processes that we've learned over the years, but ultimately who decides what realities are we're going to work on together. As I put that, I don't believe in silver bullets. I wasn't quite sure if it was vampires or werewolves, so I got to Google it, so I couldn't get that wrong, so we're that's for hunting vampires. And I truly feel honored and humbled to have been invited by ECHO to share my experience in celebration of their 25 year, one quarter of a century anniversary. Uh, their staff, <clears throat> Brian and Renee and many others have been remarkable in receiving us and prepping us for our talks. So when they reached out to me, I kind of thought, I wonder why they chose me, as there's so many people with vast experience. And um, one was, I had met D Dick Duggar at an Amaranth Institute conference almost 10 years ago. And as um, mentioned, he has been, was fundamental to the work at ECHO. And I hadn't actually known his involvement in ECHO as much. Um, but he supported our work at, with Amaranth as well. And then the, in, the, in the conference kind of objectives, which are so important, it talks about improving lives through agriculture and community development. Speakers share practical solutions to agricultural challenges, personal experiences, and strategies for improving the lives of millions um, who suffer from the effects of, of lack of access to enough sufficient food. And I thought about I've been to so many conferences where you get a lot of information that really is hard to apply, and so I hope the little bit that I'm able to share is something that can kind of make a connection with some of you, and we can further discuss um, during these days or else at some other point down the line. The other is that I'm <clears throat> um, working in the U.S., Africa, which is echoes as a lot of work as I understand. Context to me is so critical. And based on the context, your 
designed interventions are going to decide whether or not they're more effective or less, and also how much transfer and actual shared learning goes on. Um, and I've always, with Amaranth people, as I mentioned, Silver Bullet, I kind of shared an analogy like a kaleidoscope. If I want to look at health, you kind of shift it, and we'll talk about the nutritional properties. If I want to look at sustainable agriculture, you can shift to Amaranth and actually start conversations. If you want to look at it in equity, you can shift it. So I mean, I think there's a lot of topics that get bundled. So although it's not a silver bullet, it is a platform to discuss a lot of interest because at the end of the day, as you all know, when the community's interested or has prioritized the need, it's a lot more effective coming, coming forward. So but our context is Oaxaca. Um, you can see there at the bottom of the screen in dark black, it was for a long time had very disproportionate rates of malnutrition. Um, to this day, in a lot of the uh, extended communities, there is still a lot of um, malnutrition, but there was a big public health campaign, and it's actually not as so much. But I did want to kind of show you on the map, it's the southern part, almost towards Chiapas and then Guatemala. <clears throat> but I also, it's a lot easier to me to kind of look at all the positive resources that are available. So Oaxaca is an incredibly diverse um, state culture, community, and social values. There's 16 um, indigenous communities, over 40% of the population in Oaxaca. And all that has to be taken into account. There's 580 municipalities, so 580 local governments. But they actually also have traditional governments, so there's almost 800. And all those subtleties when you're looking at presenting and working with the local content <coughs> and culture. So why Amaranth? First one to share with you, that's what Amaranth looks like in Oaxaca. We can talk more specifically in the, in the Meet the Speaker about some of the more specifics. But we work s primarily in two regions, and the Amaranth varieties are Acruentus, and it's all grown on local farms with the farmers themselves. And now we're also doing a lot of um, incorporation within the traditional milpa systems. <clears throat> but essentially, and you can find, um, Amaranth seemed to be a kind of natural opportunity, although it had been eradicated in a lot of spaces for, uh, in Mexico. But its cultural and historical relevance, its nutritional properties, environmental, um, favorable environmental friendly attributes, and then agriculture, economics, and we'll talk a little bit about farm economics. So it just felt like a slam dunk from the, from the outgo. In terms of historical and cultural rele uh, relevance, it was native to Mesoamerica. There's findings in caves in Puebla from around five to 6,000 years ago. It was very important in the Aztec diet and religion. There's a lot of different stories, and none of them have been absolutely confirmed, but why was, when the conquest happened in, in Mexico, it seemed to have disappeared. Some say it was for preference towards wheat. Others say it had religious implications and that it was an offering towards the Aztec kings as kind of part of their um, religious system. Um, so they were opposed to, to that. But essentially, it went from 20,000 tons of production to next to nothing. So actually, as we put the concept of adoption, it's kind of rescuing an ancient grain, but it actually isn't as common or wasn't as common 20, 25 years ago. <clears throat> so nutritional values, many who have worked with Amaranth, that's kind of one of the first things that pops out. Um, and especially, there's a lot of studies out now around healthy food systems that a lot of developing countries kind of skipped the healthy food. So they had very important needs, not enough food, very few, very little diversity. And all of a sudden, now they have Coca-Cola, junk food, other types of, and very little diversity. So outside the school, they're buying up fried plantains, fried 
um, pigskins and things like that. Um, this week, there's a big conference in Guadalajara um, through the SLAN, which is a coalition of stakeholders in Latin America who are discussing what we're now calling a food academic in Mexico. There was one th over 1,000 diabetes-related deaths, enough to fill up the Miami football stadium two times over just last year. <clears throat> I couldn't get this over for, it's easier to just copy my slide that I had in Spanish, but I think you can get the, signific uh, the significance. So, for so long, when Puente started, it was about malnutrition, children stunting, um, the other issues around uh, need, nutrient needs. But actually, the other part that kind of came up as the learning process was the dual burden. And so oftentimes, people who are affected at an early age with malnutrition actually have a higher propensity for other um, overweight-related issues. And, and obviously, people even with wealthy, with more wealth, they have more buying potential. And if they're buying the wrong types of foods or they're not informed about what selection of foods, you're also seeing um, this crisis of obesity in Mexico. So that's amaranth. You've probably seen these slides. If you've essentially, first, if you look at the grain, as a, um, it's very high in protein. It's got good um, calcium, um, iron, and others compared to similar grain crops. But what's also unique is you can, uh, the vegetable in Africa, especially, there's a lot of work been done with um, promoting the consumption of leaf amaranth. And there's compared to coal spinach, just to give you a sense of um, the potential it has because it becomes a very versatile plant as it can be used kind of in all stages, although there are some preferences around which type of varieties you would choose if it was for leafy production versus grain production. We've done some experiments where you can actually take away leaves during the earlier stage without affecting grain production. We can share those studies as well. I think most of us here believe in climate change. Um, as is, amaranth is also considered part of the, um, has been purported a lot as being able to be grown in kind of heat, um, is a heat resistant plant. Um, and it has, is also known as its versatility. There's so much work to be done. Some of the amaranth um, conference told me that the research on amaranth is basically what we had on corn in the 18th century. So you, just a, a wealth of work to be done. But I think as a C4 plant and its evolution is that, is a kind of potential for s certain regions. But also, again, we go back to context. If you're in a wet, cold, cloudy region, there's probably other alternatives um, to consider as well. There's not a single solution um, in whatever, whichever context. And then agroecology, which I was really excited to see all the work that Echo's done. Um, what we found was you're not going to get rid of corn. A lot of times, too, I'd come in and say, well, if it's a superfood, let's move the corn over, put in amaranth, and, and we we've found the solution. But actually, if we could incorporate it into a larger, more well-known traditional milpa system, when there are certain pests or certain um, crops that are affected by the weather, the other ones can then be used for food security and at the family level. Um, and also, just we've learned so much as an organization around soil health. It's not just about growing a lot of amaranth so that people have a healthier food alternative if we're not doing justice to the soil. Um, and very new, and I saw some talks that I'm excited to go to about water conservation. We have about 500 millimeters of water up to 800, and I know that should be an acceptable range for amaranth, but a lot of it's about how it's managed and what other uses it's put towards. So hopefully I can learn a lot from you all this time as well. Um, I don't expect you to take, kind of understand the graphic as much as just to show it's super complex. I think there's a talk on farm economics today or tomorrow in the sense that <clears throat> Oftentimes, we're also so focused on one part of the ecosystem that we're missing out on other understanding what needs to 
happen within the system to allow our particular intervention um, to happen. And I found that in Amaranth, there's a group of about 50 organizations, and we've been working for now five or six years on trying to positively affect public policy. But if we don't have really clear the different ways we can insert and, and really prepare ahead of time, um, these impacts that we desire are oftentimes well-intentioned and actually don't pan out. <clears throat> so looking at our work as agriculture in a food system, especially for those who maybe also work on nutrition, all the institutions in Mexico, it's we're the Health Institute or we're the Agriculture Institute or we're the Economic Institute, but this is all tied together um, if we're looking at, in that sense. So I kind of start up top and then kind of our work is more grassroots, holistic, participatory, but trying to understand where we're fitting in. Um, so Puente's model really is just looking at a local healthy food system um, from farming amaranth along with other local um, crops for first self-consumption. A lot of times the first thing people come down, philanthropists and others, hey, we can find you an export market for all this great stuff. But if people aren't eating the good stuff, they're replacing that and there's studies out processed rice, pasta, soup. So they're actually producing a very healthy food source, exporting it out, and then substituting. There's some people who would debate whether or not that's happening, but my, our, our survey, baseline survey with 180 families, clearly showed a shift that the replacement foods for black beans particularly um, has been highly processed car, um, carbohydrates. And then we could add on that three liter Coke bottles for breakfast. You probably not, you can probably understand where that's going. Um, and then access to markets and commercialization. This is a big bottleneck. Those who've worked on Amaranth is I finally figured out all the things and now I have this beautiful plant, I'm gonna harvest it. And who can I sell it to? And in, in what forms? So those who like Amaranth a lot, I can share with you a lot of resources there. Um, So we've got 20 minutes left, 18 minutes to be exact. Um, vision, mission, um, values. You can just pull this off the website. But what I thought was really important learning for me is if you leave the values part behind, you can have the most incredible mission and vision. But oftentimes as an institution, we forget about the people we are, the people we work with. And um, so kind of when I meet a partner, go into a partnership or go into looking I always try to make sure that we're more or less on the same page about what it is that kind of gets us out of bed in the morning. Um, and so we as a team developed our, our values and really try to live by those. <clears throat> this is in Spanish, but one of the um, more on the public policy, and you've all probably heard these, the right to food is the first translation. The second one is food security. And the third is food sovereignty. And it kind of breaks down their origins and also their kind of conceptual frameworks. And, and what, farther along, what is the kind of end goal of these different terms and how have they been used? There's lots of definitions and, and applications for them. But I, I bring that up because you'll hear these terms a lot. And I think language is so critical to really what is a proposal towards food security? Is it a local food security? Is it a global food security? And the same with food sovereignty. What are the resources even available? Um, the context. And then how, and then the right to food and what human rights framework, why that's been successful or not in moving public policy forward. And kind of a reflection, my, we actually changed our mission from eradicating malnutrition with Amaranth to promoting, contributing to food sovereignty. And that was a very critical shift in our mission because it was more than in a kind of existentialist or assistance, like a, a handout type. It wasn't, it, was, it wasn't intended that way, but it came off as our mission that we were going to help the other with their problems as opposed to we're contributing to a system and as the system changed, that empowerment should shift 
and become shared, more shared across different cultures and different communities. Um, so I just, we also work in indigenous communities that have, we have to come in there with a whole lot of humility and also a whole lot of ignorance on really what it is that um, is their history, what it, what it is around their customs and cultures and even, as they call it, cosmovision, but their religious and spirituality. I think every culture has spirituality and it, <clears throat> certain um, ways that we can connect, especially as we come in as interventions from outside. Um, so the challenges to food sovereignty and local farm econ uh, economies, I've listed a few here. But essentially, as I mentioned earlier, peasant farming has been considered a kind of uh, necessary evil. You're a peasant farmer because you haven't made it through the school system and, and, and you haven't. But I'd say that's more of an issue. There are people who are going to leave farms if they have opportunities. There's other people who want to stay on the farm. I think that's an economic question about how can you make peasant farming um, viable. Um, and, and what all the pressure, external pressures to kind of get cash based into a cash based economy could be discussed over lunch or over a week in the field. Um, climate change variances, there's a lot of studies about how they disproportionately affect people who are resource limited. A lot of you have probably been involved with that. Um, and then there's the kind of the corporate interest, the political lobbying that goes into regulatory policies for the ag industry. Those are all, in Mexico, they have an OXCO. They're very similar to 7-Eleven, I think they're called here. But they're popping up. We call them the plague. We don't have a herbicide for them or a pesticide. But they're essentially out, they're kind of like putting all the local food out, out of business because they are, they're one shop one-stop shop, and they've really become popular outside. There's a Pepsi truck, a Coca-Cola truck, and they're essentially um, doing very well. But the concern of that is if they're doing well, is that changing the, the eating habits of, of the folks? So I'm going to, I'll just share this with you, but there's some thoughts for deeper reflection. If we want to have rural communities that are thriving, and livelihoods, is that something that is possible? That's my big question. If we're going to work on farming, that has to be possible because we have millions of people living in the cities. But unless we want to go to a kind of eating a pill a day, um, I think that has to be really thought about because there is a tendency to move away from um, farming lifestyles. Puente went through a six-year uh, strategic plan. Um, and ultimately, I put that up there more just to say, we started at three years, and then we said, no, it's never going to get there in three, five, six. And as Echo completes 25 years and maybe is thinking about the next 25, development work takes time. Um, and I think it's so often that we're responding to immediate needs, whether it's getting money from funders or showing these great um, impact results in two or three years, that it's kind of unrealistic. And oftentimes, we don't set forth the best plan forward because we're kind of constrained by the pressures of limited resources. And now I'm going to show you a quick video um, from our 15-year anniversary, but to bring you closer to Oaxaca. It's five minutes. Equivalent to our sweet 16 the idea of moving into woman.
toda la familia nos dedicamos al amaranto y nos apoyamos en el momento que se requiere. Esto casi tuvo su origen desde como cuando vinieron las, esas gringuitas que le digo hace como unos 15, 16 años. Cuando llega Puente se reactiva esto. nos apoya de varias formas, por ejemplo al inicio nos da la semilla para ponerlos al mar, sigos, nos da un, un apoyo económico pues, para componer las tierras, para gastos de mozos, para lo que nos haga falta y luego nos da el asesoramiento con los promotores, por ejemplo en mi caso nos dio lombrices para preparar los abonos orgánicos. His wife would replant the seeds every year. Some of our communities have irrigation, others just use the rain. Ahorita que ya está puente, es otra cosa. Aparte que del consumo también nos da ingresos. Cuando hago una galleta, primero los niños la prueban y ellos me dicen si sabe bien o no sabe bien. Si regresan por ella la sigo haciendo, si no ya no. Cuando yo veo a un niño que se la come y regresa a buscar más y que decide comer lo que hago y dejarlo de la tienda, me hace sentir increíblemente bien y me dan ganas de seguir trabajando. Donde más me gusta venderlas es en la escuela. Y ya las demás las vendo en diferentes puntos de venta que empiezo a buscar, empiezo a crear mercado para que la gente de las comunidades locales empiece a consumir mi producto, yo eh, pueda dar trabajo a personas de, las, de mi comunidad que puedan tener un ingreso para su familia. In Mexico, they approved a, a bill that you couldn't have junk food in the primary schools, so that was never enforced. Aquí se está ya se incluyó en la dieta, entonces ya es algo indispensable, se podría decir, entonces no puede hacer falta el amaranto, hay que producirlo tanto en, en verde como en grano.
Thanks, and so I'm just going to go through the final half dozen slides. Just to, so how does Puente actually go about our work um, today? Um, we have a program, Farm to Table, and essentially we're promoting agroecological um, farming of amaranth, and also combining that with nutrition education and access to healthy local uh, foods um, to improve their, their nutrition. A lot of you all are probably familiar with these methodologies of farmer to farmer, peer to peer. Uh, we found a lot more success when, when we can get the participants talking about the work themselves as opposed to having outside agronomists come in. Not that there's a role for both, um, but it, it's the type of trust building that's necessary for sustainable work. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with chromatography. We just had a visit from Sebastian Pinero, he's a Brazilian uh, pioneer with agroecology. And essentially we're trying to find uh, farmer friendly tools to really look at their soil um, health and the progress so that they can see a um, direct result of what their application did as improving their soil health. As many of you know, there are some kind of quick solutions with soil uh, recovery, but a lot of them are longer term. And so if they're not seeing results, they can quickly think that what you're offering them isn't a viable solution. Also uh, from the mineral rocks, we found in Oaxaca at least, there's up to 60 different minerals that we can find. And uh, so we've developed a micro enterprise for rock crushing. Isn't that fun? <laughs> Crushing rocks. Um, and actually generates, can, if, imagine if it could substitute some of the um, store-bought uh, fertilizers. Could be a big boom for creating local economy as well as um, nourishing the soils. And also we have a lot um, using carbonization of, of, there's a carissa in particular, but to also um, have local solutions towards um, improving the soils. Um, Echo's been doing this for years, but seed banks, having local seed banks so that people are aware of the quality of seed. Um, we call them bio, bio fabricas. We're trying to put the cool back in farming, so we kind of bouncing around some ideas. They used to be called composting centers. That didn't sound. <laughs> and then also, as many of you know, farm labor can be very, especially on far, larger farms, so trying to bring in appropriate technology, um, threshers, um, winnowers, other things, at least for amaranth. It's a so small seed, so there's not a lot of store-bought machine. A lot of these have been adapted. We worked with Calvin College on one. We've tried bike energy. Very few of those have been quite as effective as John out in the, in the room, but that's part of the learning process. Then the summer nutrition programs, what we found was during the summer months, especially the, the, the mothers have, are the ones in charge of so many of the household activities that along with the school activities plus the normal, that if we could have a summer program, there was a little more free time. And so they form cooking committees and together we have a curriculum with volunteers. We actually used to work with American Amigos de las Americas Due to security issues, we actually shifted towards all local volunteers, so youth, um, and we built a curriculum. And so over three weeks, the uh, children come together and they have activities, and at the end, they have a meal with Amaranth. Um, our other program is Social and Solidarity Economics. Um, again, we really believe that putting the family in the middle as opposed to the money in the middle of our design um, and their well-being is kind of what we say when we're talking about uh, social economics. And we actually, with a partner, have a mini popper, that kind of strange looking thing in the middle. And what that does is it's like a popcorn machine at the theater. It allows you to do the grain and pop it so that the farmers themselves get the value added. So the farmer can go towards, we've set up centers, take it, get it popped, and then it, it resells directly to 30 micro enterprise as opposed to Puente being a social enterprise, we decided that the groups themselves would be. Um, almost 80% of our entrepreneurs are women. It's not surprising, probably. Um, 
anyone? So it's really interesting too how we design our, our programs to be um, gender focused and gender equity perspective. Um, next to last slide. In this kind of looking at systems thinking approach to our work, um, we've been working a lot on public policy and partnerships. Puente alone will never be able to even begin to take on these enormous um, challenges in the food system. So really trying to think about how we can partner, influence public policy, um, partners, et cetera. Even I think the private sector needs to be involved. Um, and so there's a lot of exciting work to be done, but it, it does start with a, that one has to find ways to work together. And so also Coca-Cola is so good because they spend so much money telling you that their product's great, not to put Coke, the one with the red label. <laughs> Stuff with the red label, not to pick out companies. Um, so we also have to have strategies, guerrilla strategies, to talk about why local foods are, are good alternatives. We have to have very good logistics, distribution, control, the uh, quality control, et cetera. So we can all learn from, from the other partners as well. And so my final slide is just about um, as we spend the next couple days together and then we go home, is how do my actual day in and day out, even within a big system, um, do I prepare food, do I grow food, um, and how, or how am I contributing to this more just and, and healthier food system? And with that, I again thank you, Echo, for giving me this space and thanks to you all for paying attention. Thank you, Pete. Sure.